Maybe like some of you, I enjoy watching TV shows and movies that involve zombies. <laughs> Who likes to watch a good zombie TV show or movie? Come on, hands up. See, UBC wouldn't admit it. There was only two people who put their hands up. Some of you were thinking, what are we, what are we doing here today? <laughs> I don't watch a ton of zombie movies and TV shows, but if you have seen a few of them, then you'll know that in most cases, when someone is bitten or infected and they become a zombie themselves, there is no hope of going back to their old life, of coming back to life after you become the walking dead. But I've often wondered, why not? In the world of TV and movie fiction, why not more TV shows and movies where there's a cure? And I've wondered, what would that be like to be dead and to come back to life? I recently came across a TV show called The Cure. It's a zombie TV show where... 70% of zombies, if they're given this cure, come back to life. And the show talks about the interesting reality of what it would be like to be the walking dead and to come back to life, the joy of being given a new opportunity, a new life, a new kind of lease on life. You know, so some of the hardships of the difficulties of transitioning into that new life. That in the show, something that was dead has come back to life. And there's a joy in that, but also a difficulty in that as well. We are in Paul's letter to the Ephesians. We're going to be starting in in chapter 2. And the first chapter of Paul's letter to the Ephesians, Paul is inviting us to fix our eyes on God and what he's done for us. As Pastor Ken said, the most important thing about us is we are in Christ. In fact, if you want to take away one thing from this whole sermon series, it's this. You are in Christ. And Paul's inviting us to fix our attention on him. And in chapter 2, the focus shifts a little bit. We still have our eyes on Christ, but our eyes also on us. What does this mean for us? And Paul uses some language in chapter 2 that might feel like it's at home in an episode of The Cure, that that TV show about zombies that have been dead and come back to life. As he talks about a people, namely the Ephesians, of God's people and of us, who were once dead and who have come to life. And what does it mean to live as God's alive people who are resurrected with Christ? So I want to invite us to take out our Bibles, can read chapter 2. We're going to read verses 1 through 10 together. And usually we read from the NIV version. I'm going to read from the ESV today just because of some language choices that I prefer. So if you're reading in your Bible and it seems different, it's okay. Just follow along. Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 10. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, have been made alive together with Christ." By grace, you have been saved. And raised, he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. It says, not of your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared before us that we should walk in them. Let's pray together. Jesus, we give thanks that you have made us into a new creation. And I don't think there's a person here who wouldn't say, 
I want to come more fully alive. And Jesus, you are the great preacher who is at work through this passage and even in this message. I pray that you, Lord, through the Spirit, would preach to our hearts, to our lives, because we know that you are present in this room with us. So, Lord, we are here. We are present. Our hearts and minds are open to you today. Amen. Paul's letter to the Ephesians is roughly a 2,000-year-old document that the Apostle Paul wrote to a church in Ephesus. Paul was literally shackled in chains while writing this letter. And he's writing it to a, a church that he knows really well, as I mentioned, a little church in the city called Ephesus. It's a church he knows well because he pastored them for many years and he visited them in, on a number of occasions. And he literally watched this church grow. In one way, he watched them grow physically and numerically as people began to hear the good news of Jesus. And they, being captured by this good news, began to join the church and worshiping with them. And things began to change in the city and in, and in this church group. So he watched the church grow numerically, but he also watched the church grow in maturity. As the lives of people began to change as they encountered the good news of Jesus. Now, we know that the lives of many of these people changed in, because of the book of, of Acts and some of the things that happened in, in the life of the city because of Paul's preaching and the work of this small church. And we can imagine how some of the specific ways of some of these specific lives of those who lived and worshipped in this church might have been. I imagine a young man who's filled with anger, who responds in harshness and anger towards his wife and his children and his neighbors. And he encounters the loving, generous mercy of Jesus. And being moved by God's generosity and mercy begins to be moved away from anger and towards gentleness. And his wife and his kids notice a difference in him. I think of a, a young person who's ambitious for the future, but are using their time and their energy and their finances for their own sake to try and get ahead. Very common in the ancient world where generosity was not a virtue. But they begin to learn that everything that they have, their finances, their gifts, everything is a gift from God. And recognizing it as a gift, they long to be generous as God had been generous to them for the sake of others, to use their money for the sake of the poor, to use their time and energy for the sake of others in their church community and in their city. Or I imagine a, a person who was used to worshiping at the temple of Artemis, the, the big temple in the city of Ephesus. And they were in the practice, as many people were in the city of Ephesus, of engaging in prostitution as a form of worship. But they encountered Jesus and they begin to realize that their body, what they do with their body matters. And what they do with other people's bodies matters as well. And their whole idea of sex and love and physicality begins to change and alter around the life-altering message of what Jesus has done for us. It's not hard to imagine the drastic ways in which some of these lives would have been changed. And reading through some of Paul's language, he knows this church really well. It seems that some of this church who has encountered the the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, and who on seeing that, their life began to change, have gone back to some of these old ways of living. And Paul uses some pretty strong language. If I read it again from verses one through two, you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air. Paul says you were dead. Really, Paul? Broken, sure. 
Hurting, sure. Confused and misguided, sure. Don't we, those, those words feel comfortable for us, don't they? But Paul says, dead. You were dead. There's a sense of finality to being dead, that there's nothing I can do to really get out of being dead. Paul uses this really strong language. But for Paul, we were dead. Before Christ, in certain ways, we were dead. We were beyond hope for ourselves. In what ways was that? Well, in one way was our eternal fate. For some of you, when I ask you, what does it mean to be alive in Christ? That might be one of the ways that you think of. Maybe it might be for you the most natural way. That when we experience the life-altering forgiveness of Jesus and are made alive, one of the ways that you might think is that we are made alive beyond the veil of death. Jesus uses this language of coming from death to life after we pass away in John 5, verse 24. He says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life, does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. But Paul in this letter doesn't primarily have our eternal fate, our eternal life in mind. He's talking about this life. That one of the ways that Christ takes us from being dead into life is the ways that we, in Paul's language, the way we walk, which is another way of saying the ways that we live. That Paul had seen firsthand the lives of those people who had come to know Jesus in the city of Ephesus, who had joined the church, he'd seen their lives drastically changed by the good news. And now he sees them going back to some of the old ways of living that they had previously engaged in. And if you'd followed Jesus for any number of years, then maybe for you, that's not good news, not good, not good, news, not good music. Sorry, there was a, a little ringer then it'll be easy to imagine of someone coming to hear the good news and and going back and trying to follow some of these old ways of being, being drawn in. The pastor and, and, and academic, Eugene Peterson, who used to teach at Regent College on the UBC campus, and who's one of my favorite writers, he talks about it like this. He frames it around resurrection and cemetery habits. Let me read this for you. Resurrection is not something that we add on to everything else we are accustomed to. It makes alive what has been dead through trespasses and sins. It's understandable that we'll carry old cemetery habits and assumptions into this resurrection country. We have, after all, been living with them for a long time, if you call it living. And we require a patient, long-suffering reorientation that prevail in this resurrection country into this full stature of Christ. To rephrase what Paul is saying in Eugene Peterson's language, this people who have come to know Christ and now live in resurrection country, they have been raised with Christ and have been made alive. They find themselves being drawn back into some of these cemetery habits, these old ways of living that marked their old life. Now let me draw a connection with our opening story about zombies. Imagine a zombie from this, the Cure TV show. And they've been given the cure and made alive. And you're sitting with them and all of a sudden they, you find them nibbling on the arm of the person they're sitting next to. It sounds crazy and silly, doesn't it? That something that had been dead was made alive. And yet they're engaging in these old cemetery habits, chewing on arms sounds crazy. And in a way, Paul is saying some of the same thing. Some of us who are made alive in Christ, don't go back. Don't go back to these cemetery habits. You are something new. You are a new creation. Don't go back to these old ways. And yet, it's understandable, isn't it? The draw of some of these old ways of living, some of these cemetery habits. Many of you know that I came to faith early at university through a friend 
through a good church and the grace of Jesus. And early on, I had this great desire to follow him and to shape my life around him. And it was exciting and beautiful and really made me feel alive. I remember attending a house party and my group of friends who, you know, we were focused really on gratifying ourselves, drinking as much as we can, smoking weed together and even looking for one night stands, really gratifying ourselves. I remember showing up to this house party and a bunch of them were standing outside together. And I joined this group of people and I remember feeling deeply conflicted. I'd been given a new life in Christ and began to see myself differently. And yet, how was I to reconcile this way that I was still continuing to live in light of this new hope and life that I've been given in Jesus. And I remember about 30 minutes after joining the party, I excused myself. I think I said I was sick and I walked away. And that was the last time for a number of years that I saw them. As I stood at that party, I felt deeply conflicted about my desire to follow Jesus more fully and embrace this resurrection country. I wanted to become fully alive. Yet a number of years later, I found myself rejoining this group of friends casually and engaging and re-engaging to a lesser extent some of those same cemetery habits. How do we reconcile? And what do we do when we are longing to live in resurrection country, when we've become a new creation and yet still find ourselves drawn to these cemetery habits? when we find ourselves alive in Christ, but participating back in some of these old ways of living. Well, if you can relate in any way to that story, the good news is Paul's letter to the Ephesians is for you. And Paul's answer to this for the Ephesians and for us is not to enter into a three-step plan. It's not even to focus ourselves on our failures, to tell us to, Buckle up our boots and get to work. Instead, what he's inviting us to do is to focus ourselves on what Jesus has done for us. To get caught up in a fresh way, the wonder and beauty of what God has done. And by re-getting caught up in the wonder, to be invited in a deeper way to new life. So that's what we're going to do today. We are going to get re-caught up in the wonder of what Jesus has done for us. So let's begin Ephesians 2, verses 4 through 6. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. We were raised up with him and he seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. The most important thing about you is that you are in Christ. If you want to take away, as I said, one thing from this sermon series, it's that you are in Christ. Do you remember the hula hoop that Ken brought in? I think it was last week. And he invited us to imagine what it would be like to step into the circle of Christ. And that when we belong to Christ, the things that belong to him also belong to us. And two of those key realities, one is that when Christ died on the cross and was buried, that the sins of the world were taken with him on the cross and were buried with him. And when we belong to Christ, so too our sins and failures are buried with him as well. And when we belong to Christ, when we are in him, or as Paul said here, when we are with him, we are also raised to new life, just as Jesus was raised to new life from the dead. A few weeks ago, we celebrated Easter, and that's one of the days of the year when we focus our eyes and our attention on the resurrection more than any other Sunday. And yet, Christians are called to be a resurrection people to not just celebrate and live the resurrection one day a year, but to live it every day of every year. 
We are a resurrection people. And one of the best ways that we can remind ourselves about the reality that we are made alive and made new is through hearing stories. And one of my favorite ways to hear stories is through baptisms. If you were here on Easter Sunday, you'll know that we had seven baptisms. I think six of whom were from our Creole youth because our youth group here is on fire for God and we're celebrating that. And just a couple of weeks ago, I was re-listening to those testimonies, just enjoying the beauty of what God is doing in the life of this community. And one of those testimonies stood out for me, the testimony of Oriana Lee, who I've asked her permission, and she said that I could reshare her testimony, a part of her testimony with us today. And what I want to invite us to listen to is this, which Oriana does it so well. In fact, at the 9 a.m. service, I almost said that she preached to us because I feel like she did. More important than our own story is the story of what Jesus has done for us. More important than what we have done for him is what he has already done for us. So let me invite us to play that now. There doesn't need to be a crazy backstory to my life. The epic emotional part of the story wasn't about what the people went through, but what Jesus went through for them. Moving forward, I think this will serve as a good reminder for me that my life story isn't about how well I've survived on my own, but how Jesus has given me life beyond survival. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I come before you today with a heart softened by the humility of Jesus' death, a soul revived by the new life given me in Jesus' resurrection, and a mind set on giving God all the glory. This is my public statement of my decision to keep on seeking Jesus in my life and growing to be more like him. My name is Oriana, and I'm ready to be baptized. If I were to ask you to share with someone around you, I won't, but... If I were to ask you to share a part of your testimony with somebody, what would be some of those good news markers of where Jesus has put to death sin and has made you to life? Where Jesus has made you feel more alive? Where you've experienced his resurrection and joy and fullness? One of the greatest ways that we can enter into and be reminded of this good news that Jesus has given to us is by remembering that good news, either in the lives of others or in ourselves. And I want to give us just maybe 20 seconds just to stop and remember some of those milestones in our own lives. If you were to turn to someone around you and share your testimony, what are some of those spaces in your life where Jesus has put to death sin? and has made you alive. So I invite you just for 20 or 30 seconds, you can close your eyes if you like, what would be some of those markers that you would share with someone else? beautiful, isn't it, how different our stories are? If I asked each of you to come up and share two or three things, how different they would all be. And yet, likely, if all, if not in the vast majority of each of your testimonies, one thing would be the same. That you came to realize that the most important thing about you is that you belong to Jesus. The most important thing about you was not your failures or who let you down, but the most important thing about you is who brought you in. The most important thing about you isn't how much money you make, isn't what job you have, 
isn't your sexual orientation, isn't the letters that follow your name, PhD, MD, MA. The most important thing about you is that you belong to Jesus and that you are in him. That is the most important thing about you. And if you're here and you say, I am in Christ, I belong to him and you haven't been baptized. Why not? Why not? Paul commands us. He says, rise and be baptized. But more than a command, which it is, it's also an invitation to get caught up in the wonder and beauty of what God has done. Are you struggling with some of those old cemetery habits? Get caught up again in a fresh way. Get dunked deeper in the life of God through baptism. Or maybe you've been baptized and you think that was great, but it's hard to connect again with that memory each week. One of the reasons that we do communion every week is a reminder that we belong to Jesus. And each week we come needing his grace and mercy and forgiveness. And we come with hands open receiving the broken body and the juice representing the blood of Jesus as a reminder that we are a people in need of his mercy and his grace. And how do we receive this? Do we earn it? Is it based on our merit? Is it based on how well we recognize and respond to those cemetery habits in our lives, some of those areas of of failure? No. We receive this forgiveness and grace. We are one with Christ. We are in him, not because of what we have done, but because of the work of Jesus. And Paul emphatically says this in verses eight through nine. By grace, you have been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing. It's a gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. The most important thing about you is that you belong to Christ and what he has done for you. Even in the midst of our failures, our cemetery habits, our desire to leave an old way of living behind and live more fully alive with Christ, we are given grace freely by him. I shared with you earlier in the sermon that A few years after coming to know Jesus, I found myself drawn back towards this old group of friends and some of these old cemetery habits I had let go of. I was deeply lonely and longing for friendships in places that I historically had knew. As Eugene Peterson said, it's hard to leave behind something that we know so well, isn't it? Especially when things get hard. And I found myself drawn back to these old cemetery habits. And it was a season that was deeply confusing for me. There I was, a new creation in Christ, having received the grace and forgiveness of God. And yet, here I was on weekends, living as if I had before I knew him. What did this mean? What does it mean to receive grace when it doesn't feel like we've earned it? During that season, I I read a book that had been sitting on my bookshelf since the day of my baptism. It's a book called The Cost of Discipleship by the German pastor and preacher Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And in the book, he talks about the difference between cheap grace and costly grace. Cheap grace is freely given. It demands very little of us, but it gives very little in return. Costly grace is also freely given, and asks much of us, but gives so much. Let me read a quote from Bonhoeffer to you. Costly grace is the treasure hidden in the field. For the sake of it, a person will go and sell all that they have. Costly grace is the gospel which must be sought again and again, the gift which must be asked for, the door at which a person must knock. Such grace is costly because it calls us to follow And it's grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It's costly because it costs a man his life, Jesus. It's grace because 
It gives a person the only true life. It is costly because it condemns sin and grace because it justifies a sinner. Above all, it is costly because it costs God the life of his son. You are bought at a price. And what has cost God so much cannot be cheap for us. Above all, it is grace because God did not reckon his son too dear a price to pay for our lives, but delivered him up. Costly grace is the incarnation of God. Costly grace is Jesus. And in that season for me, these words were a breath of fresh air. Because even though the invitation into costly grace invites all from us, invites us to seek all of our lives to align with Jesus, the costliness of the gift of grace ultimately does not depend on me. The costliness and the weightiness of that gift in our lives ultimately depends on the reality that Jesus determined his life was not too weighty a price for you or for me. That fortunately for each and every one of us, the reception of grace, the invitation to more life does not depend on us alone. But the invitation to fix our eyes on the grace of Jesus to receive a gift that is so costly that God did not consider the life of his son too great a cost. Do you want to live life more fully? Do you want to let go of some of those cemetery habits that feel like they keep pulling you back towards death and away from life? Paul invites us in a fresh way to get caught up in the wonder and the beauty of what Jesus has done for us. To stop turning our eyes inwards on all of our failures and look towards Christ's great victory on the cross. It's freely given and freely earned, but that doesn't mean it's cheap. It costs Jesus his life, but in return, it gives every person the only life that ever mattered. A new and renewed life in Jesus. A life where we embody what it means to be in him. A life that lives in resurrection country. Do you want to live a more full and beautiful and happy life And free life, fix your eyes on Jesus and the gift that he offers to us. As we come to a close, I want to end with a passage from the scripture that we read, verses four through nine. This is a reminder for us that the good news doesn't depend on the eloquence of a speaker doesn't depend on the power of the stories that I share. The good news depends on the trustworthiness of God shared for us through the Apostle Paul, through Jesus himself, through the New Testament writers, and that we gather each week to remind ourselves to live in. So let me read this for you. This is good news for you and for me. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when you were dead in your trespasses and sins, that he made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. And you were raised up with him And he seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It's a gift of God, not a result of works that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Amen. Let's pray together.
Jesus, we thank you that you have made us alive in you. That our identity, that our purpose, that the most important thing about us is not our failures, it's not our past. We don't have to prove anything. That while we were dead, you made us alive. And Lord, today, I know this personally. I think everyone knows this as well, the deep temptation to go back to these old ways that we know or remember, to engage in cemetery habits, ways of living that actually feel like they steal life but are so familiar or so tempting. Well, Lord, we know that the good news is that we are not defined by our failures but are found by your love. And that each of us who have confessed your name and said that we believe in you, we are in you, and that is the most important thing about us. And so today, I pray that we could worship, that we could enter into this reality, this good news, that we are in you that we are a new creation, that we are, are free from those cemetery habits that draw us down, that draw us back, that they do not define us, that we can live in freedom, that because of what you did on the cross, we are not condemned, that you see us with the same eyes that you see Jesus. We are free. We are forgiven. We are fully alive fully alive in Christ. Church, you are fully alive in Christ. So Lord, we fix our eyes on you. The maker and creator of all things, the forgiver of our sins and the resurrection life that is at work in us at this moment now. We pray all these things in your name. Amen.